Hi, it's Major Croy. Uh, today in this uh, video we're going to talk about uh, our basic ambulation again and the first thing we're going to talk about is a patient's weight bearing status and then the next thing we're going to discuss is the level of assistance required for a patient to transfer as well as during gait. Um, during this I want you to make sure you're taking notes and then refer to basic ambulation uh, slides that I have for you in Blackboard. So regarding a patient's weight-bearing status, weight-bearing status goes through these five levels here. The first being full weight-bearing or FWB. This is how we document it. This is an appropriate abbreviation. There's no restrictions for a patient who is, is full weight-bearing um, when it comes to gait. They can put as much weight or they should put as much weight um, on their lower extremity as they, uh, as they can. And so um, full weight bearing is, uh, um, is how we would do that. Absolutely no restrictions. WBAT, weight bearing as tolerated. This is where the patient gets to decide how much weight they can put on it. And then you allow them to, you allow them to do it. Um, if you say, hey, put as much weight as you can tolerate on it, but they keep their foot up off of the floor or they just put their toe down, that's something where you need to encourage them to place weight down on it. And so weight bearing as tolerated is a, um, you, sometimes you have to coach people into that. Um, you can do weight bearing as tolerated with either a cane or with crutches uh, there. And generally, you know, you can decide what that is based on the patient. And then PWB or partial weight bearing. Partial weight bearing, this is the toughest one to coach because when it says partial weight bearing, sometimes the physician or, or you would decide how much the patient should be able to put weight on there. You might say about 25%, 50%, or what we call foot flat weight bearing where just the foot is just flat on the ground just like that without much weight on it. Um, you can do partial weight bearing only with crutches or a walker. You can't do partial weight bearing with, uh, with a cane unless it's real, real low levels of uh, um, partial weight, I'm sorry, real high levels of partial weight bearing, 80% or above. A cane just doesn't unload the lower extremity that much. Um, but partial weight bearing, um, again, something you're really going to have to coach your patients to do using tips or tricks such as, hey, if 25%, uh, uh, you know, try not to if you're putting your foot down on eggshells, we don't want you to crush the eggshells. Um, you know, that can be you know, less than 10% or, or whatever. And so you gotta modulate it you know, based on you know, what these, uh, um, uh, what these uh, proportions are. Then toe touch weight bearing. Toe touch weight bearing is just basically that. It's just putting the, the, the ball of the foot uh, down, you know, and it's generally just for balance. When a patient's brushing their teeth, combing their hair, if they have any, um, <laughs> then you know, you can tell them to be you know, toe touch weight bearing there just so that they can have a little bit of basis support. Uh, you can do that for using only uh, crutches or a standard walker, not a rolling walker to do toe touch weight bearing. Then non weight bearing, none. There's no, they should not be putting their weight down on the foot, you know, at all. And that's a risk. Uh, physicians will say non weight bearing and that means exactly what it is. The foot stays up off the ground. Um, you can only do this with crutches or a standard walker. Rolling walkers cannot do non-weight bearing. Non -weight bearing. Only uh, rolling walkers, you, know, you can really do weight bearing as tolerated. But again, referring back to what rolling walkers are mainly used for, mainly used for balance. And so you'll generally see these weight bearing restrictions in, in uh, orthopedic patients only. Now the level of assistance required this is, a, this is a judgment call that you as the physical therapist make, and it's a qualitative assessment of patient independence. And so, and it's really, it's task specific. And so, um, and we'll document it like this. No assistance required, a patient is independent. You can refer back to the graph that we showed, independence versus mobility. If a patient had, doesn't require any assistance, we call that independent, or I with a circle there. Minimum assistance, they need a little bit of help, Moderate assistant, assistance, they need a little bit more help. Uh, max assistance, that's really where they're, they're, they're pretty much dependent. And so you as the therapist, you kind of judge what the difference between minimum and moderate is. Um, it's hard to quantify, you know, there until you kind of see, you know, uh, you go out and you work with patients some, you know, then you'll be able to tell kind of the difference between minimum assistance, moderate assistance there, all right? Um, and then maximum, maximum assistance. And so this is really how you, you'll be able to document exactly how much help you give for patient, whether it be for transfers, advancing a limb, using crutches, uh, standing up out of a chair, all of those types of things, those labels can be applied toward, to, to your patients. So just two examples that we had referred to in previous videos here, back to our 18-year-old male that was instructed to be 
weight bearing is tolerated. This is exactly how we would document this on the first post-op day after this uh, young fella had surgery. Um, if the physician wrote that he's to be weight bearing is tolerated on his right lower extremity or RLE, um, he ambulated 100 feet with minimum assistance for balance. And so my my the level of assistance here was just was just for balance. That tells me, hey, he can run his crutches only, and I'm just there to stand by him, you know, for balance. He doesn't need to be, you know, helped along by any means. He can move under his own power, and I'm just there to, you know, help him uh, stay upright in case he gets woozy. Now, uh, back to our 50-year-old female that had multiple sclerosis. She ambulated in her room with a standard walker. Remember at home, what was she using prior? It wasn't a standard walker, it was a rolling walker, okay? And so now that she's hospitalized, you know, we take that rolling walker away, we need the standard walker, just to because she's weaker and she may need a little bit more support for balance, and so we went back from a rolling walker to a standard walker. Um, 50 feet with moderate assistance to advance the walker, and so I'm helping advance the walker as she is uh, walking in the uh, uh, in the device and minimum assistance for balance right and so using a gait belt around the patient's waist that's nice and snug I have one hand in her lower back holding that and if she gets wobbly I'm right there right next to her and that's that's moderate I'm sorry minimum assistance you know for balance I'm just there I, I'm basically using my hand to kind of sense how her balance is as well as I'm watching her as I'm using my other hand to advance the walker um, I take vital signs after a therapy session like this. Her pulse is 105, blood pressure 130 over 70, respiration 30 after this session. She's independent with sit-stand transfers there. And so you can see as I can apply my level of assistance required on three different, on three different um, tasks here for this specific patient. And so make sure that when you're, when you're using these, you're saying exactly what it's for. How much assistance? and for what task, whether it be balance, transfer, advance of a limb, um, standing up, um, advancing the device, or whatever. Okay, that's it.